In October of 1947, KTLA presented the first children's show in Los Angeles TV history. It was hosted by Shirley Ninsdale and was named after her puppet, Judy Splinters. There wasn't a big division uh, between, say, the technical side and the performing side. We were all kind of one family. And uh, so that uh, we felt very close to the people we worked with. Uh, Judy would sometimes answer the um, switchboard. Um, Klaus didn't like that. Well, that we did several things, I guess, as kids will do. In 1949, Judy and Shirley received the first Emmy ever awarded. In June of 1948, KTLA began another landmark children's program, a full-length dramatic presentation called Sandy Dreams. Sandy Dreams marked the first time west of Chicago that a television program was produced with actors and a complete script. I'm really Say, Sandy, what kind of a dream is this anyway? Well, Stuffy, it's sort of a holiday for me. A dreamer's holiday. Climb aboard a butterfly and take a lot of breeze. Let your worries butter by and do the things you please. In a land where God builds a falling off the tree. A couple of months later, KTLA introduced a show that seemed to be anything but scripted. Your old buddy with Bud Steffen and his sidekick Joe Flynn was designed to explain to viewers how this new thing called television worked. Never mind. Lloyd, will you bring in that camera, please? Never mind. I've got Just some very good pictures with this camera. I remember once I was down in Texas myself, I took some pictures of the road. Thank you. Excuse me. Road Here we are. Right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this one. is the regular television camera. You notice that it's mobile. And here are the different lenses. He can get different shots without even moving the camera, simply by rotating a handle on the turret here on the back. Show them the back, Joe. This is a great thing because it saves so much time. Now, notice this large section. What are you doing? I said show them the back. Never mind, just never mind. Just get out of there. Thanks very much, Lloyd. Okay, Thanks bye. a lot. I was doing a Sears Roebuck ice cream, hand ice cream commercial. I was the stage manager, and I was supposed to show the guy how to operate it. And I didn't know that Klaus and the guys were in the control room. And I was clowning around with the ice cream freezer. The child could operate it, and of course it wouldn't, and I had my knee on it and all that. Just clowning. And they all came out, and Klaus says, oh, you go on Friday night. <laughs> I says, doing what? He says, that kind of stuff. So that's how that started. Also in 1948, KTLA had the foresight to obtain a show that appealed to kids of all ages. Klaus bought the rights to the old motion picture series Hopalong Cassidy for the Los Angeles area. The show starring William Boyd as Hoppy became a sensation. Every kid wanted to dress up like Hoppy, and Boyd became a millionaire, also helping to make television more and more appealing to the public. At its height in 1951, Hopalong Cassidy was the number one show in Los Angeles with a 46 rating and an 82 share. Don't do that! Where I come from, men don't go around slapping little boys. Let him go. Well, I didn't mean any harm, mister. But of course, if you're asking for it... 1949 saw the premiere of the first television program devoted to the world of show business. It was called Hollywood Reel, directed and shot by Coy Watson and written and narrated by Erskine Johnson. For the first time, behind-the-scenes footage of Hollywood celebrities were seen on television. Kirk Douglas, Stan Laurel, Robert Stack, and Lloyd Bridges and his family. Four Bridges. Lloyd his wife and baby son, and nine-year-old Bo. Also fledgling TV stars of the future, Dinah Shore, Jack Parr, and Jackie Gleason. More than anything else, Klaus loved to take his cameras and thus the audience outside the studio. He went wherever something was going on, and a lot was going on near the Southern California beaches, where different ballrooms were presenting live entertainment. One such place was the now demolished Santa Monica Ballroom on Santa Monica Pier, 
It was from there on August 5th, 1948, one of television's and KTLA's first big hit variety shows originated. The Spade Cooley Show. The Spade Cooley Show. Starring my fiddle and friend and yours, Spade Cooley. Welcome to the Santa Monica Ballroom. Well, we've got a fine show lined up for you tonight, and we'd like to open the program with a tune that features a very fine steel guitar playing of one Noel Boggs. So here is that steel guitar act. Oh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Where's Noel? He didn't come back from his dancing lesson yet. He didn't come back from his dancing lesson. <laughs> no. The Spade Cooley Show, which ran 10 years, was part variety, part country music, part comedy, and all successful. The success of The Cooley Show touched off a wave of musical variety programs on KTLA. From the Aragon Ballroom in Ocean Park, Harry Owens and his Royal Hawaiians began on KTLA in 1949, and the show was an immediate hit featuring Hilo Hattie singing favorites like Sweet Lilani, Owens played what he called music from the islands south of paradise. Within a year, the show was voted the most popular television program in Los Angeles. For Southern California country and Western fans, this is hallowed ground. Today, it's the main post office of El Monte, California. But many years ago, it was the El Monte Legion Stadium, where every Saturday night, it housed the telecast of Channel 13's hometown jamboree, starring Cliffy Stone, later to be seen on Channel 5. It began way back in 1949. Tennessee Ernie! Ernie, come on back here. That we served a purpose. Uh, we got up there when we were all idiots, had no knowledge of what we were doing, and, and did our thing like monkeys in a cage. We said, look at me, watch me, you know? And a lot of time it was awful, I'm sure. I have looked at a kinescope, I only have one, and it is so bad, I can't believe the show was ever on. They learned about cameras on us, and they learned about lights, and they learned about sound, and they learned about production. And we were fortunate to have been on the scene at the time that that red light came on. Very fortunate. How about you folks? You had a good time, huh? Why don't you all come out to hometown Tambourine, huh? At the end of our show, and now we really must go. We hope you all come back again for more. And if you are, This building on Vermont, which now houses a Korean newspaper, from 1948 to 1951, was the home of KFI TV, the original call letters of Channel 9. Many programs originated from here, including a weekly one-hour live dramatic program. This long-lost 1948 episode of Treasures of Literature, Oliver Twist, has not been seen in 44 years. The series was produced, directed, and adapted by Peggy Weber, who also portrayed Nancy in this episode. Oliver wasn't hurt, was he? No, the devil ran right into their arms. Oh, thank heavens, they promised they they promised she did it. She's been sitting here near crazy all evening. You. Hey, Pete, Yes. Oh, no, Bill. I love you, Bill. I only did it for our good. Maybe someday we could get out of all this. We just couldn't go on the way we were, Bill. We need a you. Nancy. Nancy. The budget 
was generally no more than $300 per show. And I used to go to Western Costume and became great friends with uh, the people who worked there who thought it was a lark. And when we did Wuthering Heights, for instance, they gave me all of Scarlett O'Hara's costumes from Gone with the Wind, and they still had the label in them, Vivian Lee, Gone with the Wind, and so on, and they were very recognizable. And uh, we, we would get the entire show wardrobed for $25. And uh, the actors were usually paid the magnificent sum of about $10. One of the first shows from Channel 4, then called KNBH, featured the songs of a group called the Pickard Family. And even in 1949, ratings were always on television's mind. If you are marking an R-E-L-I survey log, please write the letter A in the first column after the name of the program which you are seeing and will be writing in your log. nice people. It's good to see you again. Come right on in, won't you? Come right on in. Good evening, Mr. everybody. How are you doing? Hi, Hi. 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 Welcome, welcome to the Pickard Homestead, friends. We want you just to relax and make yourselves comfortable and be happy. Say, gang, let's head off for the bright blue horizon. Well, you better get the old train started. Right. Right. There we go. Beyond the blue In the late 1940s, cooking shows were the big rage on Los Angeles television. Every station had one. At KTLA, ours was called Tricks and Treats, hosted by Chorus Guy with her sidekick, a kid named Stan Chambers. What have we got here, Chorus? Well, you know, Stan, I don't usually do any comparative testing of foods. I know you don't. Well, tonight I'd like to try, have you try, though, two different cups of coffee. Well, that's fair enough. Is this something new, though? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, at KFI-TV Channel 9, Money Margetts was cooking away. Before the show, I had to mix up a cake batter, which I'd never done in my life before. So here I am in the darkness because Bill Welch was doing a show at the other end and the lights were all down there and everything had to be quiet. So I'm making the batter according to the recipe, going crazy. And all of a sudden, a man comes in with a huge ladder and plunks it down right by my kitchen table and climbs up. I said, what are you doing? He said, I've got to change a burned out lamp up there. Well, he was fiddling around and all of a sudden, just as I was getting through the batter, this black stuff, flakes, kept coming down right into the bowl. And I yelled out a yell, and despite poor Bill Welch's show, and he said, oh, that's all right. Just tell them it's raisins. Channel 7 featured Chef Milani. See how many product so mentions the chef can work in. See, we master that with a coffee. And then we, we turn the sunbeam mix master. And then over here I have some balls made out of the wonderful Hunt's pictures. This is a something that really only with a Wilson tender made ham you can do that. Because a Wilson tender made ham, that's the ham that you cut with a fork, you know. And you know when you use a good product like Hans food, <laughs> you can go wrong. And a lot of people say, well, what about the baking? Well, if you bake with Western Ali, you got something. All right, we'll put the some over the butter. By the way, this is a rough for butter, you know. Give me them green olives, so those see that That's early the California green olives. I got a bottle there. Uh -huh. One jar of Ricky Rock for dressing. Uh -huh. See this, you don't have to mix. That's homogenized. KTLA's first regularly scheduled public Day. affairs show well, was a weekly really live up. production called City at Night. Hosted at first by online. Dorothy Gardner uh, and the late Keith Hetherington, and right. later by Ken Grau. City at Night took viewers on location to exciting events all over the Southland. Here, 
1949, oh, no. Dorothy and Keith were on the but sound I'm stage sure. where the film Destination Moon was being filmed. Well, Dorothy, if, uh, if we can uh, get back down to Earth, uh, I wonder where we'll be next week. Huh? Well, I don't know, but uh, you know it'll be someplace completely different. Uh, I wonder if it'll be someplace on Earth. Well, I hope so. I, I think it'll be somewhere completely different in our city at night. I remember before we went on, our station manager, Klaus Landsberg, came out to Keith and I, and he said, Now, I want you to remember, like I said, television is different from being on the stage. You're not playing to an audience. You're playing to one person. And he said, when you look into the camera, think of one person and you're talking to one person. And also remember, when a person turns on Channel 5, they're inviting you into your home and act accordingly. Before long, viewers were learning to automatically turn to Channel 5 whenever a major news event broke in Los Angeles. KTLA's first on-the-spot news coverage came just days after the first commercial broadcast. On February 21st, 1947, a large factory exploded in East Los Angeles, and Dick Lane was there with KTLA's live cameras. Just about everyone who had a TV set was watching KTLA's coverage of that explosion, and the newspapers suddenly realized that they were going to be in for some tough competition. But the event that really established television as a news medium occurred right here on what is now the athletic field of San Marino High School. On April 9th, 1949, this was a vacant lot. And right about here was an abandoned water well that reached 230 feet down into the ground. Three and a half year old Kathy Fiscus lived nearby. And on that fateful day, she went playing in the lot. Somehow she tumbled into the well. So we started in and having no idea that we'd be here uh, any length of time. It was, let's see what's going on. The thing that is so incredible looking back now, we had no idea of the impact that this was, was going to make. I can remember sitting in the front of a uh, pickup truck, kind of cold, maybe two in the morning with a microphone on my lap and thinking, who in the world would be watching this? It really brought the, the city together. Uh, Los Angeles was a big city, but on this one weekend, it became a small town city. Neighbors would visit neighbors that they didn't know very well. They'd uh, sit in front of the set. They'd have dinner there. They'd go to sleep on the floor. Really right up to the end, well, till an hour or two before the end, we really thought that uh, she was going to be saved. And all of a sudden, uh, the word was that, that, uh, that she was dead. And everybody broke into tears. Everybody was quiet. People walked away to, to be by themselves. And uh, it was a very emotional thing. And I think that's the impact that uh, people watching had. That for the first time, they experienced the long form of television, that they were a part of this whole broadcast from the moment they started looking. And having spent that much time and that much emotion and that much energy to find out that she was dead, the whole city really suffered a personal loss. And as my colleague at the scene, Bill Welch, was to learn, the coverage also had a profound effect on the grieving parents of the dead child. Gene Biscolo, then the sheriff of Los Angeles County, had brought in a lot of his deputies to help the San Marino police handle the crowds that were gathering. And he came to me and he says, you know, the Fiscus family was watching this on television until it got so sad that they just, they turned it off and they don't know what's happened. And he says, they know you, Bill. So would you be willing now to go up to their home and tell them that the little girl is dead? And I said to Gene, I said, who was my friend, I said, of course, I will do it. So after the 27 and a half hours of television, I went to the, called the Fiscus family together and told them that Kathy was just not coming home. The 1940s were now coming to an end. In less than three years as a commercial station, KTLA was already establishing itself as a major force in the social fabric of Los Angeles. And from its first baby steps, television was now beginning to take bigger strides. A man who helped shape television as it reached into the 50s and has been doing the same ever since is Steve Allen. Next, Steve Allen, the 1950s, and Liberace. Lawrence Welk, Fred Astaire, Sheriff John, plus much more here on LA's very own KTLA Channel 5. 